Hello, my name is Carol May Whittick and welcome to Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening Woman. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. Who is the Awakening Woman? She is the woman who's seeking a greater possibility in her reality and looking for solutions. She knows being awakened is not a lofty ideal but a necessity. If she can transform herself, she can change the world. Her conversations will introduce you to talented women who will speak to your spirituality, sensuality, soul. They share their stories and explain how they are in service to the world. So let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. My guest on this week's Her Conversations is choreographer and non-linear movement method teacher Mina Adu. The non-linear movement method was developed by Michaela Boehm. It's a powerful and transformative modality that works on releasing tensions, trauma and awakens new energy and bodily wisdom for the practitioner. During our conversation, Mina shares how her early life experience and love of dance led her to this method, her observations of the traumas that can affect working creatives and the empowering potential of getting young women to connect to their bodies. So as always, I begin each episode by asking... Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. When do you feel at your most her? I think it's any time I feel like I'm expressing sort of uniquely who I am, I guess. So that can take many different forms. It could could be when I'm, I don't know, doing my movement practice or when I'm holding space for other people or for myself. It can be when I'm just really happy. It um, just any kind of like u- uniquely mind self-expression, mm-hmm. um, listening to music, um, sharing my gifts or things that I feel I really love that I, you know deep in my heart with people, um, and just when I'm marinating in the meaner essence, you know, it's just it just you feel how your you know that resonance just raises. So I think it's really important, and I think what's interesting is that. For some reason, I've gone on a bit of a journey where I didn't know it was okay to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or I hadn't make, made time for it, and I, or I didn't know it was important. Mm. But now I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. So the more you just sort of play and sort of do the things that make you who you are or make you feel yourself, that's it. That, mm-hmm. that's, that's how uh, one can really sort of feel more resonant, more feel more depth in themselves and in the world for sure so I think that's really important beautiful yeah. and Mina can you just talk a little bit about how you came into doing the work that you did was there like particular um events that happened in your life that kind of led you or would have led you that stick out into oh I can see why I'm, I'm at where I'm at now there's many different strands to this but I think the one that I start with is essentially sex. Sex is like the main, um, is what I would say is one of the main things, just because everyone can relate to that realm. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was essentially just um, having, seeing issues in that area of my life and then how it related back to my childhood. So I had quite, um, I was quite shy um, quite a sensitive child, um, sort of home life was a bit all over the shop. Essentially, there was a lot of sort of um, unspoken things, quite a repressed childhood. And as a sensitive child, like, so I know this stuff now, back then I didn't, but it was like a, you know, absorbing of all the sort of darkness, the unspoken stuff. And just a real need to survive and to do that sort of disconnection from my body and just like having to tough, tough it through, tough it out. Mm. Um, so there was just massive disconnection, I'd say. Um, not really much mod- role modelling of like healthy relationships or affection or harm- harmonious relationships, you know. But there was no like out and out abuse, but there was just, you know, all these layers, all these things that can build up and sort of make a shell. Mm. So, like, I was that kid. I was also the middle child. So I was always, like, a bit, like, felt a bit odd one out. Mm-hmm. But I was there, this sensitive middle child, just, like, absorbing everything in the house. And then I also, like, used to... Uh, I was quite shy. I was quite overweight. 
I used to sort of like eat loads um, just to try and sort of numb um, feelings and and then sort of cut forward to when you start having boyfriends and stuff and everything just shows up in the relationship, especially in the sexual relationship. So that was when I started going on this sort of journey of trying to unravel or kind of um, take off those layers, find out um, why things were showing up, find out, um, yeah, just kind of undo all that stuff or sort of work it out, let it go. Um, and that took me on a journey of learning so much about sexuality. I read all the books, I did all the workshops, so many different things. So I did, what did I do? The shamanic breath work workshops. I did um, uh, rebirthing breath stuff. I did plant medicine, ayahuasca. I did, um, oh my God, I can't even think of them now, jade egg stuff. So many different workshops. Um, just, just too many things. But it was over like a period of about 15 years. And I had de-armoring sessions and all these different things. Just trying to sort of work out why I felt quite broken, like why I wasn't responding in the way I wanted to respond. Or, and it mm. be was becoming a problem in my relationships too. Mm. I was quite sad about that. Um, so, yeah, there's just a lot. So <laughs> that was basically what led me on this journey. Um, sexual stuff and then childhood stuff in relation to that that's interesting and you know that you were saying that from the and and there are so much that you were saying that I can relate to as well because things were never necessarily said but it was felt but because it wasn't said and it wasn't addressed you you can't be sure that it's a thing because no one's talking about it mm -hmm. what do you think it was about you that had the curiosity or was l led somehow to just look at the situation go there must be something else and 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 seek out something that was going to start to pull you out and think you know because because a lot of the time I find if I'm kind of uh, relating to where you are that it came from a place of resignation. You know, it's like, this is our lot. What we've got to do is just be strong and get from A to B in our life. Whereas obviously there's part of you that go, there can be something different. Do mm. you, do you recognize, can you think of, or pinpoint of what it was or what inspired you to think that there must be something more than just this and us just being strong women, because it's one that you hear all the time, especially as black women, strong black women. And all we're doing is just armoring ourselves. Like you said, putting layers and layers on and still going out and facing the world and toughing it out and and then still being inside that child broken but facing the world as this tough strong black woman when that's not necessarily really the case you know um we all need healing on dif different levels in terms like race generationally all of that kind of stuff but what was it that was a catalyst for you what inspired you do you feel I have, this is, okay, there's different layers to this question as well, so. Sure. <laughs> but there's always so many layers. Of course. Um, I generally, I came through onto the planet quite dissatisfied, I think. Mm. I was just, like, looking around, like, really just, like, I've really taken this journey and this is where I'm at. Like, I was really just unimpressed, generally, with, like, this three-dimensional wherever we live mm -hmm. and so I always had this feeling like this can't be it like this can't be it it can't just be this and I was also a middle child so I was a bit I was very observant and I was mm -hmm. quite shy and quite quiet so I was always just watching people and, and learning and I was very sensitive so that took me on more of like the sort of artist path and I was like oh, this is a space where I can like actually you know learn stuff and find things out and, and people are doing different things and so it mm -hmm. became quite an exciting um avenue for me to take and it started with dance I used to when I was little I used to like copy all the dances from um Janet Jackson on the tv and all the routines like I, could, I was like yeah 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 and so like, like on the tv I could see all this glamour and all these like amazing, all these amazing things and all these routines and all this you know stuff it's like a different world mm. oh wow yeah that over there this is not me as a nine-year-old girl so it's like oh yeah over there people are doing stuff and so I think I just always had a dissatisfaction and a curiosity and mm. just a belief that my parents didn't necessarily know the truth. Like they were just living the life they were living. Um, but I knew that I knew that there had to be more. I knew. And I asked my mum when I was, I think when I was about 10, I said to her um, that 
I said to her, I don't want to have a job that I don't like. I really want to have a job that I like. And I remember she totally laughed in my face. <laughs> <laughs> she, laughed. she laughed in my face. Like, oh my ah, God. that's not, oh my God. Like, that's not possible. She was just like, she actually just burst out laughing in my face. Oh my and I was God. like, wow, oh my God. Like, looking back, I'm like, that's so sad. Like, it makes me really sad to think that that, that was your belief. You know, yeah. that you had to sort of like be on a nine to five and uh, just work in any old job just to get money. Um, but I always knew that there was something more. So I just, it was natural curiosity and mm. sensitivity, I think, and just dissatisfaction in general. I hear yeah. that. I hear that. I always wondered as well, it didn't, it didn't make sense. Certain things that didn't make sense was one, that, that mindset. And also hearing people would always talk about they, these they people. It's like, well, this is what they say and you know what they do about this. And I'd be like, well, who, who are these people that they, but no one could really define who this they were, yet their right. lives were completely controlled by they. You know, right. that, was, that, that was my confusion. But I, I <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, but... <laughs> Who's they? Who are they? It's, doesn't it make sense? It's just big people, big people living yeah. in fear of these invisible they's. And I, was, I don't get it, you know, as a child. And, and, and even now, still, I'll question the, the they thought, and, you know, and you're trying to move left or right of something that everyone's going down blindly and you're trying to every, tap everyone on the shoulder going, where are you going? It's like, well, they're going that way. So it look, that looks like the way. I'm like, it doesn't look like the way to me though. It's like, does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> and it is literally the blind lead, lead in the blind, you know, and it's, and then when you have this inkling, but I hear from you as well. I think it was for me, it was reading autobiographies, reading autobiographies, and watching um, like Saturday morning TV because I was really into music and, and performing. So just seeing people and reading their stories and realizing they didn't just turn up on TV like magic. They, a lot of them came from, you know, so I could see that they, they came from normal houses and did normal things and went to normal schools. It was trying to work out how to get from A to B, but it was like, okay, they didn't just turn up. They just want these lucky television celestial people that no one yeah. can touch they were human <laughs> beings <you> no <know? laughs> <laughs> it's true and I mean also I think there's like there's in in, in all of that the, the day the, the day people mm. like my parents like they didn't really have much family over here they were like immigrant they were Ghanaian immigrant parents mm. so you're looking around like okay I have no family here I'll just what, what do we do so there's, there was like an unspoken um thing just like this is what we do when we're here and we're just going to make this life because this is what everyone seems to do. Mm. But no one was talking about like the sort of broken lineage or the past or what they left behind. Like we weren't talking about that. Do you know what I mean? So the guidance wasn't there, that their, mm. their own bodily wisdom and their own sort of, um, this is how we're going to make it here. It wasn't there and it wasn't safe. You know, it also wasn't safe. They were like a Ghanaian immigrant family in the early eighties. It right. was difficult. They had to work two jobs and, you know, so they were just trying to survive, essentially. And so I think the day people was just like some kind of, okay, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's frightening how it gets there. And I've heard, like, adults going, all oh, the kids say today, they don't want to work, they're lazy and that. And there is a level of, like, m millennials have a different kind of mindset about stuff. However, mm -hmm. if you're constantly hearing adults complain about their work, why are you going to want to go and put yourself in it? It's like you're not, you're not selling it to them. So don't be surprised when they don't want to do what you're moaning about all the time. They're not lazy. They've just been uninspired by, by you yeah. and, like, frightened of spending, like, the back end of their lives being miserable as you guys are <laughs> just showing them how, how miserable they are. And, but it's good that, you know, there's, there's a change. And also technology is starting to help us to do our – to see how we can each take our own talents out into the world as well. Obviously it takes work, but it puts the power in our hands and it also kind of eliminates the gatekeepers of deciding who's going to be there on, on all levels, even in creatives like the, um, the, the, the music industry, which was where I was like working a lot before. Did you ever work as a dancer? Yeah, I, um, I danced from when I was very young. I sort of like took myself. I was all sort of always on my own. 
mm. I sort of, my parents were kind of always working. So I took myself to dance classes when I was 11. I used my pocket money to pay for it. They didn't mm. even know. To this day, they didn't know I did this for years. They don't even know. Um, uh. And so I did ballet. I did tap. I did jazz on a Saturday. And I think at the local church um, hall. And on a weekday, I think that was one weekday evening I used to go. And then just from there, I did dance as a hobby, just in my sort of spare time after school and stuff. Mm. I just down local classes. Um, wherever I was, I'd, I would do local classes. Um, and then I went to university, no, went to college, still did dancing in my spare time. Mm-hmm. Um, went to university up in Leeds and found <laughs> dance classes up there. Um, and for my first degree, I said to my mum, I want to do a dance degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like... <laughs> Mm, no um and so I didn't do a dance degree but I did um I did a cultural studies degree instead which was cool actually which was really cool cultural studies and media Mm. and then I worked for a while at a media company and then I was like actually I really want to be a dancer so at 25 I left my job my full-time job and just went to dance college so I did I got into a, a foundation, two-year foundation, and then I did a three-year degree. Mm. Um, and it was a real moment of like, okay, I've led, I've done all this stuff for my parents now. I've done yeah. this. And now it's time to do something for me. And my parents couldn't say anything because I'd, you know, I'd done the degree and I'd done the whatever and it wasn't working for me. So, yeah, I trained and then I did some professional dance jobs. My focus was mainly choreography because um, it was more like the creative movement part that I was interested in. Yeah. But I did... Yeah, I did do dancing and, and continued with choreography. That's great. And when did you get into the the work that you do and that the non-linear movement work that you're doing now? Did that follow soon after that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird when you've got to try and condense like your whole life into like chunks and sentences. It's weird. <laughs> um, so... Did my choreography stuff, doing dancing stuff. And then um, I got a really, I got a job with the show Stomp. I think I told mm. you before, yeah, yeah. Um, which was great. And I learned the show, learned the show. There was one day left of rehearsal. And then, but all through that process, I was getting really ill. And I wasn't sure if it was the right thing for me. Um, I had like anxiety. I wasn't eating. I was just, it was messing me up messing my mm-hmm. body up I was having some kind of like signals anyway, yeah to, to what I was doing and so I didn't actually take the job like I, I left after the rehearsal period mm. um and just was like I don't know what I'm doing this is like this is like when I was 31 mm-hmm. so I was really just trying to sort of just go what am I doing like I've done dance I'm doing choreography it was a bit on and off then I was a bit getting a bit disillusioned with it because the industry can be quite, as you know, it can be like, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Going on there. Um, <laughs> we'll just put it that way. Um, <laughs> and then, so and I got this amazing job. It would have been like, you know, world tour and West End, great. And I wasn't happy. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. So then after that, it was quite an intense five year period where I just sort of like surrendered, let it all go and just kind of, started to do some inner work started to I did that book the artist's way yeah yeah I did that book at, this is the time I did it I had that book for like seven years beforehand and never and could never do it really and now yeah it took me seven years to do that book but yeah I gave mine away and I really really regret it because I really fancy doing it again I should buy it again but like I said at the moment I'm kind of doing like a big shed but yeah. I remember doing it ye- years and years back I've probably still got the journal somewhere actually in storage and um yeah it it was it was mad and I gave it away to an an actress friend of mine as well for her to do so I don't know if she ever actually did it but yeah Yeah. how did you find it it was so hard like the first sort of I kept looking at it and then going oh those morning pages oh like it was really scary you know but then after I sort of had this job, left this job, I was like, I was ready to do it. So I just dived in really. And it was amazing. Like it really helped me to open myself up to new possibilities and mm. have perspectives. And I started writing poetry at that time. Um, I started just seeing myself as more of a, as a, like a more of an open 
curious human being and allowing that to sort of guide where I was going next rather than trying to focus on this or that or the other mm -hmm. it just really opened me up in a lot of ways um since then I've given I've given that book to like three different three or four different women and like the things that have happened in their life like literally from this book amazing people have moved countries one woman moved to Brazil and started writing a book another woman's moved to Paris and she had done that book gave her that book Another woman um, got divorced and be has become an artist. Like, so it's a really powerful, it's a really, really powerful book. I recommend mm. it to yeah. yeah, she did. So, so the nonlinear movement then part came from that? Yeah, that was the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, this is just a regular conversation and that's the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> um, so I had a sort of five-year intense period Mm -hmm. I, I did you know did the ayahuasca did all the internal work breath work just trying to make just trying to find out why wasn't I happy mm. I was like, why am I not happy what's gonna make me happy and just curious and trying all these different things putting no pressure on myself doing the artist way just living day to day and being happy with that I actually got an artist studio at this time and started painting as well so it was all just like whatever's coming through is coming through um and then I w at the time I was doing an online womb, no, cervix, cervix releasing course. Mm -hmm. um, and on that course, my teacher, Michaela, was doing a podcast. They interviewed her. And so I, I found out about her from, from online from this other course. And I was like, oh, she's something interesting. So I went onto her staff and saw that she was offering nonlinear movement teacher training. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what it was. I'd never done any of her work before. But I'd often thought, because of my background in sort of dance and teaching dance and movement, I thought I'd like to offer a class, but I never was interested in teaching dance or sort of yoga. They never really... So essentially, it's an embodiment. It's, it's an embodiment practice. Um, and you're in a, you can do it individually or you can do it in a class. Um, and essentially, what you're doing when you're... You do it with your eyes closed and there's music. And when you're doing it, you're, you start with touching into sensation in your body. So rather than just sort of dancing to music, you're actually kind of staying with what's happening in your body. Mm -hmm. And sensation, emotion, and sort of mental stuff is all facets of the same kind of contraction. They're all just different expressions of the same things that we're carrying. Mm -hmm. So Once you're tapping in and you're moving with it, that allows it to move through your body. So any sort of like mental loops you're having, any sort of stuck tension or sensations or any emotional stuff intertwined starts to move through. Mm. So you start to be able to um, uh, find clarity, mm -hmm. find clarity in your body and it expands your bodily wisdom. Mm -hmm. So once you've let this stuff move through, and you can do it for releasing as well. It kind of, you could say it releases. Um, you're able to come into your own body's wisdom because you have more of a clarity, all the, all the stuff's not, not there anymore. It's sort of like you're open to yourself and that's where you tap into your bodily wisdom and that supports you going forward. Mm. So um, result, the things like people have, that, what I've noticed when I'm doing it is my boundaries became really clear all of a sudden. So I was able to not just intellectually know, but I could feel in my body my boundary. Like it was really clear to me. It was, I had lots of clarity. Um, I also kind of, I think I had some, um, my teeth got really sensitized as well, <laughs> weirdly, yeah. I think it was anger in my jaw or just right. the was coming through. And what's weird is that you won't always know what's happening, but mm -hmm. your body releases it in a way that's safe and doesn't mm -hmm. overwhelm, overwhelm the body. So it comes through in subtle ways, but over time, you just notice that you're clearer, you're mentally clearer, probably have more energy it really helps to sort of in the sexual realm because you're able to sort of feel more subtle levels of sensation mm. and you're able to feel other people so you can resonance with other people. You sort of, it sort of rewilds you in a sense, sort of takes you back to your instinctive bodily nature, mm. like feeling energy, feeling resonance, your instincts all heighten, I would say, but in a really nice way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. And it's interesting what you're saying, because I was just before we started recording, I was just listening to a podcast with Michaela, actually. 
okay. where she was um, having a conversation um, with another woman whose, whose name I don't remember. But they were talking about, one, the fact that everyone is attached to their devices now. And we know that, you know, and we know it's not great and we've got to kind of work through that. Um, but what, she, what, what the, the lady was saying was like this woman was on her phone and there was, she was like in a football match and a ball was coming towards her. But she was, she was so engrossed in the phone that, you know, sometimes you get a sense that either some, someone's watching or, you know, that, like, that, that, uh, I don't know, that hairbreadth ex- instinct of you'd be like, oh, something that's, you know, your split second where you can look up and save yourself was, was deadened right. because of that, all the focus and all the energy had gone in there. So clearly even out of her body now where you're talking about having that instinct and being like aware of boundaries and stuff where, because yeah. you, you know, you know, when you sometimes get that feeling that like someone's looking at me, some, some, you can feel it from afar, but then we get we lose that a little bit because we're so, we're so closed in and, and, and also closed in, I think with, with the environment. I mean, what kind of people come to your class? Is it just women or you're getting across the board or ages or mm. professions who comes? Um, well, it's kind of, right now it's kind of a range of people. So I do co-ed classes, men and women. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but I've noticed, I'm thinking about maybe just doing women because when it's just women, there's a bit of certain, um, I don't know, a certain energy that's in the space. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyone who feels like when I write sort of like my blurb for it, people are, resonate with it. If, if it's for them, people sort of go, oh, I think there's something in, me, in there for me mm-hmm. because they know there's just something inside them, whether it could be anxiety, it could be problems in the sexual realm. It could be um, just feeling disconnected. It could be feeling numb. It could be, you know, people have grief. They just, there are, I think there are people that identify with healing through the body. And I think those people, it's very um, inviting. Um, but I've also done this work um, with people who work in the healing realms mm-hmm. and sort of using it in, in a way of like helping them to move through what they've been taking on at work and sort of let that go through through their body rather than holding on to, you know, getting all the stuff in their body and then not being able to release it. Mm-hmm. And also I think it's great for young people. I haven't done it with young people yet, but I would like to because there's a certain learning that I wish I had when I was like a young woman that I think would have been beautiful like if I would have been engaging in my body in this way mm-hmm. it would have been really really helpful as, as a young woman and um, mm. to start that kind of practice so it has many applications um but right now I saw I mainly do it with adults um and in-person workshops but mm. there's going to be some online classes coming too so I'm just testing those great um, so it's people who resonate with healing through the body. People mm. tend to find themselves in my blurb when I write it down. It's like, you know if it's for you, really. Yeah, yeah. It's just interesting um, what you just said about working with young women, in, uh, especially um, because the messaging always was, um, especially when I was growing up, is be careful, be careful, be careful when you go out there because, you know, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, shut down, close. You know, it, don't expose yourself, keep it all in, keep it all in. And now, um, and what's different, obviously, for teenagers now and when I was a teenager is the fact they've got Instagram and everything like that where they're all out mm. and they can't, it seems like they expose a lot and then they also get a lot coming back. But then women are now also feeling with, you know, I think we, we touched on it a little bit before with like the Me Too movement, where women are now starting to open up about things that they've been holding down in their bodies for so long, secrets, abuses, fear of what other people will think. And they've felt how holding on to that and, and keeping all of that in their bodies for like years, decades for some has been so detrimental and then now want to find a safe space in the world we're getting there to um <laughs> to to open it up i mean <clears throat> pardon me um how would how would you approach i know you've not done it yet how would you approach speaking to a young woman or a groups of young women and how young do you think you would start if you were to do it i mean I think it would be a case of, I'm not sure that I would necessarily, I think I would just do the practice with them. 
in mm. doing in doing the practice you've developed that connection yourself and you 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 it's not about me sort of like trying to teach boundaries it's like it's about them having the connection to themselves so they know so they feel comfortable and everyone's different everyone has you know different levels of what they're comfortable with mm -hmm. so it's about coming into connection with yourself so that you're comfortable in what you're doing mm -hmm. like so I think it's just about teaching that first part, getting the connection and then allowing that to, to do what it's going to do, to, to blossom, to flower. And each mm. person would find their own um, level of comfort and safety in their body, but through that initial connection. Sure. Got it. Yeah. It's almost like giving them the confidence in themselves, really, because I know that for myself that there was uh, the trust. That's the word that I'm looking for, mm. that I'm able to like handle myself in the big wide world you know without having to go off and be back away and pepper spray and all that kind of just like waiting for the attack as opposed to just kind of knowing that it's all good and 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 coming from it from a different part I think that's really it because I think once you give someone tools to do that mm. then it's theirs you know they, they own that they find that and it, in their body they, they know it rather than trying to tell or teach and so and that's really empowering that when you know you have this tool that develops your own bodily knowing um which then sprouts into your everyday life and you have a sense of safety you have a sense of boundaries you know things are still things are still going to happen but you're able to deal with them in a really healthy way when they happen and that's sure. that's really empowering right okay and um of course you're a you're a poet as well Mm. <laughs> talk about your book mm. and what what inspired you to write it and then got you to get down and get it done because that's always a thing as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> so a lot of those poems I wrote in that five-year period after mm. I got the job um the West End job and then was like oh, I don't know what I'm doing so actually some of those poems were wrote when I was doing the artist's way um right. and they came out of that period of time where I was just like I don't really know what I'm doing but I'm going to write to process what's happening mm -hmm. um, and a lot of time I'd just be writing and then like free just long form writing and then I would sort of take that writing and then sort of turn it into something else um, and in the book she always talked about you know just letting what's coming through come through mm -hmm. and just, so that's what I did um so a lot of those poems were written at a time where I was like really confused, really just searching, really, I'm really curious about what was next. And then, so they were there on my shelf. And then I have a friend who's a poet. He teaches English in, up in Manchester um, at a school. He, he's a, also a poet and he wanted to start a publishing company. Mm. Um, and he wants to publish, um, I suppose, we call them othered group or minority groups. So he's a he's a gay poet. So he writes around um, that, and also he's quite political in his work. He's working class Manchester, so he's quite political. So, yeah. And then he saw my stuff and was like, "Oh yeah, you could add to my publishing." Company. So we came together. He helped me put it together. If it wasn't for him, the book wouldn't. <laughs> exist. So he really helped me to and supported me to do that. He gave me the support I needed, and right. we worked together on that. Um, and that's how that book came came to be. Sure. Do you perform it live at all? Have you? I've, I've done, done a few before. readings. Yeah. I've done a few readings. I, I mean, my sense is, I don't feel like the poems are, are performance poems. Mm. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I've, I feel a bit weird about reading them, but it's nice to be asked. But I kind of prefer people just to read them for themselves, really. Sure, sure. Yeah. Have you got plans to do more writing in any way, whether it's poetry or work based around, um, or, or, or a work based around the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so writing is one of the ways I sort of process what's happening. Mm. And I find that people respond actually quite, I'm like, oh, people actually like this writing, so I should do more of it. Yeah. Um, and so generally it comes about in periods where I'm quite quiet and I'm quite introspective. And so when I have those periods, I'll, I'll write quite a lot and mm. then use that material for next stuff. So my next introspective period is coming up. So there will be writings and there will be stuff coming through. So yeah, there will be more writing. 
so exciting. I always like hearing about people's projects. <laughs> it <Yeah. laughs> inspires us, like we're bringing more stuff out, we're flooding the world with creativity. So much fun. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some of the Her Conversations questions. And the first one is, what is the best piece of advice a woman has ever given to you? Um, this is actually quite a hard question, I think. I know. Oh. <laughs> you say, evil cackle. <laughs> Um, I might have to be cheeky and just be like, I'm not sure I I can say the best piece of advice a woman's given me. Maybe it's from yoga, but it, it's it's the phrase um it's all coming or mm. all is coming, and I really love that phrase because it does different things to my body. When I hear it, um, it puts me in the present. It sort of relinquishes an- anxiety. It's just like, oh no, it's all coming. You can just relax. And once my body relaxes, then everything else just bubbles through. So that phrase acts as like a little sort of like, oh, yeah, it's okay. And once I sit back, it's all fine. You know, my body does what it needs to do. I know what to do next. I have clarity. I'm relaxed. I'm like, yeah, it's all coming. It's all fine. There's always more to do, but it's in a nice, fun way. You know what I mean? I'm not like, oh, I've got to do all the things. I'm just relaxed about it. So I like that as a phrase just to remind me it's all, it's all coming. And it's all good and it's all fine. Thank you. I felt that. I kind of like, yeah, exactly. As you were listening, I'm like, do you know what? Because, like, you, you know, I told you, like, I'm in the middle of like a major transition in the next couple of days, and I'm like, yeah. Okay, I can I can see I can see how that can work. It's it's got it's got to come. It's got to come. Do you know what I mean? Because I like you say you've been doing the work, and I know there's work to do and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that this morning. It puts you in the place to just receive it, yeah. enjoy it, and also you know there's more to do. But it's all right. It's all good. All is coming. It's all coming. Thank you. Appreciate that one. Um, and so you may may not like this question either, but what is uh, which woman would you say represents higher energetic resonance to you? I really love, I really love Erica Badu. Mm. I love Erica Badu. I think she's real. I think there are a lot of people that aren't real, but I think she's actually real. And I, what's interesting about her is that I think what alerts me to someone who I think has a realness to them is that they're not really trying to be liked but they're just appearing as they are and they're just expressing themselves how they express themselves like her artistic stuff I love it's beautiful as an artist um you know the fashion how she expresses through fashion is amazing but like when you hear her speak she's really dry and she's really funny as well and so she's just like this is who I am. She's not trying to be anything or be any kind of witch or this kind of woman or whatever. She's just like, whatever. And she doesn't always make sense, I think, to a lot of people, which I like as well. But I hear her. I I hear her. Even if she goes off on a tangent where the question marks are coming out of people's heads, I'm like, I'm getting her, I'm understanding her even more. The more more that she feels like she's going like, it's like, it makes more sense. I'm 100% with you on her. 100%. And and f- even from the beginning, you know, where she was doing like the on and on and, and that, was an ama- that was a major album because that album came out when I just moved down to London. It's like, it's weird we're talking about her now when I'm considering different things. Um, and even from then, I thought it was beautiful. But then just to see how she's just ripened. That's you know? it. That's it. Because I think a lot of the time, especially in the music industry, they can market you people. And you, I never know if it's real. I thought it was beautiful, but I was like, that could just be marketing. I don't know. But now that she's gotten older, I'm like, oh, no, she's real. Like That was really, her. And I really enjoy how she's like, as you say, ripening. Yeah, everything, because I follow her on Instagram and everything about her, the, the mother sh- that she is, it's like, you know, the, the way that she mothers, the way that she creates, the way that she talks about things, the way that she reaches out to other artists, but the ones that she pulls through that she recognises, you know that they're good. You know, like her and her connection to Janelle Monet. Janelle Monet is no fool, you know what I mean? So it's like the ones that she connects with it's like you know that that you can take it from her as a recommendation because you know that she's like 100 percent yeah 
I agree a hundred percent with her. Yeah. And it's just great. It's like, man, where is she going to be? Cause already she's just sitting in something that very few women do. And when I think of women that came out around about her time that are still, and I'm not going to name names cause I'm still a fan of some of them as well, but they're still trying to nip and tuck and suck and push it in small things and, you know, do the, it starts to, it starts to smell of desperation when they've earned that, you know, they've been in the industry for like 20, 30 years. They've earned it. I'm still a fan from day one, but you don't, but they're still trying to appeal to, I don't know who really, whereas we just appreciate them to go, well, you know, if it's looser, let it be loose. That's all good. That's the thing. I think like women or artists or people who are able just to be on their journey and allow Mm. that to happen and unfold, however it's going to unfold and continue to deepen into it. That's what inspires. That's what inspires me. Mm. Like they're not doing it for anyone else. They're just doing it, and this is and they're showing you how this is what's happening right now with me, and that yeah. it's all fine, and this is beautiful. However, it's happening. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it could she, be. She's doing all the power as well. I think she does do. She does I was it. and I was just about to mention that as well. It's like because she does other work outside of it. You know, she's yeah. an activist for like veganism, and she does doula work and everything like that. It's like real, real, real. It's like checkbox real without even trying. It's just like this is who she is. That's it. I appreciate. It. She's a whole person, and she yeah. Lets you see that she's a whole person. Yeah, and the fact that and the fashion then is just like wow. Yeah, the fashion. I don't even know how. It's just like I wouldn't even come up with that. But then when she puts it all together, you know, even when she's like wearing the chain coming out of her mouth, I'm like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. Ah. <laughs> But I mean, I wouldn't wear, I, I just look, I, it would look so wrong, but she's just like, yeah, I've got a chain hanging out. I've got this, I've got that of, you know, beautiful yeah, woman. really inhabits herself. With beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Such a great one. And um, what's your favorite self-care ritual practice? I um, really like what I do when I get up in the morning, I, it's really simple, but I, I give, I give an offering of uh, a candle flame and incense mm. um, to whoever, to myself, to the fairies, to the universe, to nature. I just um, light that candle and give incense that I like. And it just it starts my day from a sort of sacred place. Um, and it just reminds me that magic, you know, is always available just have to light that incense and and that candle and it just it puts my day in a really nice space and it starts off and it gets me out of bed like oh I want to get out of bed so I can light my candle and incense you know and give that offering yeah my day so that lighting candle in the morning first thing beautiful and and what's next for you then what's coming up in your work um so yes so I am going to be offering my workshops online, um, nonlinear movement online. So that will be coming up over the next month. So I'm excited about that. I've not done it online before, so I've been mm-hmm. testing, testing. So what now, format are you using? Is it webinars? Is it videos? Is it downloads? How is it going to come? It will be on um, like similar to this, like a Zoom call for the mm-hmm. video. But I found an app where you can, people can listen to the same music at the same time, but wherever they are. Wow. So I can control the, I will, I will control the music, but you can hear it at your end. And then I'll be able to see you on the, on the video call. What app is that, by the way? So I always like these things. It's called Amp Me. Amp. Amp. Yeah. Amp. And then me. Hmm. And it's, it's on smartphone. Yeah. Android and Apple, you can get it. Um, so there's that. So I'm excited about that. So you can do it from the comfort. Because I've had a few people say, oh, I can't get to London. Like, I'm not in London. How can I do it? Mm. I'm like, well, I don't know. But now I do know. So um, online classes will be coming soon. Perfect. Um, and then also what's exciting is that I'm starting my training as a somatic experiencing practitioner from December. Okay. So you just have to delve into that and define it a bit more because <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> So when I did the nonlinear movement, we had to read books around this method as like a, a support for what we were doing in the nonlinear. Mm. So somatic experiencing, it's a trauma therapy, essentially. Right. And it's very sort of like, 
um, it works very deeply with acute trauma in the body. Mm -hmm. So people, whatever kind of trauma actually, so you you could have people who have come from war-torn countries, people that have medical trauma, um, rape, all different forms of trauma. Um, And it's a way to bring their body back to wholeness Mm -hmm. and back to resilience because once, uh, when you've experienced a traumatic event, your body's holding it in the nervous system. So mm-hmm. it works just to unwind and release um, the nervous system. And so to bring you back to a sense of uh, wholeness and resilience, mm-hmm. like people to um, sort of, um, yeah, transform that into, it can be a, it can be a, um, a form of transformation you know what I mean mm-hmm. as human beings we all we're going to always experience some form of trauma mm-hmm. but it hasn't got to be a life sentence you can actually you know work with it release it and come to a whole new level of experience in life and it's a really beautiful therapy actually so mm-hmm. I'm excited it's like a more it's like a deep of a very deep kind of therapy um so that's like a three-year training so I'll be I'll be starting that in December good for you I always like starting new learnings it's just like it's like who am I going to be on the other side of that good for you I'm going to keep an eye on you (laughs) you (laughs) so excited for you I'm actually like I'm really I'm saying this before I've started the training but I'm really because I've had it myself and I'm really excited to help women who've experienced sexual trauma because Mm. I find so many women are carrying so much around sexuality and I think it's a really, it's it's very, very um, useful, beneficial for that kind of trauma. That's what I'm interested in anyway. Yeah. So that's kind of my, that's my area that I'm interested in working with women. So good. And it's all generations as well. And, and especially as I've found out over the years, it's like the, the generations older than me within my family that are, have repressed things around that. And it's never really ever been resolved. And they've gone through their lives into the grave with that with them and then you can kind and it's you know sometimes only in hindsight that you can understand their behavior because basically they were they were living with a pain that they didn't even know how to access or that there was that there was going to be anyone one that would listen to them or you know things like that you never spoke about you know it happened you don't speak about it you get on with your life and you try and push it in a corner and move forward and like you're saying it, it lodges in there and very few get get out unscathed so to imagine to be able to kind of unpack that and then see what your life is like without carrying that burden you know and be instrumental in making that happen it's like change lives and so not even the person not even just that person's life but everyone in their environment yes exactly exactly and there are so many people like because trauma expresses in so many different ways like we think we have anxiety or we think we have this, but there's so like, it can, it can all be traced to something. Do you know mm. what I mean? And it doesn't have to be, this is just how you are. Like yeah. there are things you can do to work with what's happening, you know, but people don't realize that they're carrying, they're even carrying trauma all the time. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really, I'm really sort of honored to, to start doing that sort of work. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. So Mina, where can we find you online? Where are your, where's the, where are your addresses? Oh, there's one more thing that's next for me. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to deny you that. Let us know yeah, everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, as well as sort of the work I'm doing with the trauma and nonlinear movement, I'm also researching how embodiment and creative practice um, can work together, sort of like wow. artistically as a choreographer. Okay. So I'm really interested in because obviously, as a choreographer, you're working with bodies, you're working with humans in the studio space. Mm. I'm interested to see how, because generally with dance, when you do a training, it can be actually be very disembodying because you're having to push yourself through, you're tired, you have injuries, you have pain, but you're still doing the thing. Mm. And so I'm interested to see how dancers and how you can work with people to bring this embodiment part in and then what that can do to like dance performance, creative practice, and how you can choreograph from that kind of place of wholeness and what that might do in a dance performance that's interesting and that's to work with professionals or or amateurs still right now mostly professionals Mm. um so since there's a lot going on there there's a lot of trauma in the dance industry a lot Mm. 
so <laughs> I'm interested. I'm, I'm researching that at the moment. So that's what I have a residency. And yeah. I've, for the past 18 months, I've been researching that and running workshops there. So that's also an artistic strand of my work. What and, and I, we're going off on another tangent, but I'm curious to find out what your opinion might be on this. Why do you think there is so much trauma and abuse in the creative industries? What is you know because you, everyone on some level or not has experienced it. If you've gone or attempted to kind of get into create the creative industry, there is abuse from people who feel, feel there are gatekeepers. There are abuse from people who are believe they're your competition. There's you, you, just levels and levels and levels. Obviously, you know, it's like, why do we believe that? Why, why, why do you feel it's there? Because it's creativity is life, really, you know? Mm-hmm. It's such a big question. Um, I think at the heart of it, people who enter these in the creative industries are very sensitive. Um, mm. They actually they are artists. They're very sensitive, and they're holding a lot of stuff. And you know, sometimes art is the way you're processing the stuff. And so you're, you're in there, and you've got all your stuff, and you're and you're working through it through the art. Then you have other people who are trying to make money or mm-hmm. sell it or whatever and so it's like a weird thing about people selling your trauma in a weird mm-hmm. way and then you have other and then and then I think there's a lot of this disillusionment do you know what I mean in it because I think you're entering into it in a, from a pure desire and then you get into it and it's like wow this this is really messed up mm-hmm. so I think people get disillusioned and then, then when it becomes a career and you're trying to work out that, you're sort of taking yourself away from your initial um, desire to do the thing. And there's very few actual artists, you know, people who are really stay true to themselves once you get into that industry because it's so difficult. Mm. If you're trying to make money at it, it kind of, it, it takes you in, in a weird, into weird things. And so I think it gets all murky. Um, and people also, I think a lot of people who are working in it there's a there's a there's a, a, a desire for validation you know there's a desire to be seen I think it's, it's a pure desire to be seen and recognized as a person yeah absolutely so there's also that so it's there's a lot happening in those industries and it takes a lot of navigation and support and guidance from good people mm. um, to give you the strength um, to stay in yourself and and stay with what's really going to be the right thing for you. Because mm. the road is just littered with casualties, really, isn't it? And I've I've not seen the the newest version of A Star Is Born, but that is like like a a, a dramatization of creativity and genius and all that comes with it, and then the the destruction of it. You know, so. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the new version actually because I really rate Lady Gaga. I think she's amazing. So yeah, I think she's great actually. Lady Gaga. Yeah, she's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's yeah, she's definitely real from day one. Yeah, that you could that you could see, and and it's and there's and, and another one is as as she's ripening, you can see that she's softening. Mm. in a way that all of those defences and all of the and I love the fashion and she still embraces fashion but it's just it just comes in a different way the drama's still there but it's not necessarily a meat dress but I like the meat dress even as a vegetarian <laughs> I wasn't I, I wasn't overly offended by it it's just like you know what good for you but yeah yeah let's see yeah. it that way um yeah so we just need to find out where you are online so everyone can connect with you yeah, so the best way to do that is if you go to my website. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is www.minaadu.com. Mm-hmm. You probably have the website somewhere in your... Yeah, so I'll put it in the, in the show notes and everywhere it turns up, yeah. Yeah, so if you go to that website and then sign up to my newsletter, sign up to my list, um, that's where I share everything I'm up to, my um, in-person workshops, my online classes, um, what I'm currently writing about, researching, reading about, and thinking about, it all goes to my list. So that's mm-hmm. the first point of call. Just sign up to, to my website list. Perfect. So thank you, Mina, for spending time with me on this week's Her Conversations. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, Carol. No problem. Yay. Thanks to Mina for joining me on this episode of Her Conversations and thank you for listening. You can discover more about me and the Her Project by visiting my website, carolmaywittick.com, at C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E-W-H-I-T-T-I-C-K.com. And if you sign up for my weekly newsletter, you'll receive information about any offerings from previous guests of Her Conversations and also specially curated content from me. On social media, you can find me on Facebook under Carol May Wittick and my Instagram and Twitter handle is Kasmic, that's C-A-Z-M-I-C-K. I would also appreciate you leaving a comment, liking or sharing any episodes and also if you subscribe on the platform you listen to you'll be notified as soon as a new episode is published. So thank you again and until the next episode, thank you and goodbye.